Metro Talk Radio. You're in to all things music. Art is in some ways an escape. I mean, in a way, art is a drug. Art is where you go to make the world better. Art is imagination. Art is get me the hell out of here. Art is um, I'm different and I need to express it. Art is all those things. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show, and thank you for tuning in. I want to let you know how much I appreciate you joining us on our show every week. And if you missed our last interview, you can hear it and all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it or download our app and take us with you. So often I get asked questions about the creative process. So I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business and entertainment business. You're really in for a treat as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in music, to share their stories on how they have influenced the music and art that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest today is Beth Lapidus. Beth Lapidus is the creator of Uncabaret, now celebrating its 25th year. She's hosted and produced it as a live show as well as for Comedy Central, Amazon, and Comedy World Radio. Beth has appeared in or on Sex and the City, NPR's All Things Considered, Politically Incorrect, and written for O Magazine, El Decor, the LA Weekly, LA Times, Los Angeles Magazine, and LA Yoga. She has coached thousands of creatives, won numerous NEAs, and is the author of Did I Wake You? Her latest one-woman show is 100% Happy 88% of the Time, which she has toured nationally and is currently writing as a memoir. Please welcome my guest today, Beth Lapidus. Hey, Beth. Hey, Terry. It's so nice to have you on the show and to have a fellow... Thank you so much for having (laughs) me. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. (laughs) I was going to say a fellow broadcaster because what I didn't say is you also have hosted your own... Uh, podcast and and radio shows as well, so that makes it even that's true more that's fun true. an hour. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted, did very. I did, oh God, no. Ask me. You, you go. <laughs> you. Go. You. I, I actually you go because you're my guest. What did What did you like to say? No, no, no. You go. Honestly, it'll come up later. Okay. Okay. Let's go. You go. You just. You describe yourself as a comedian and a writer, performer, actor. And my first question is, does your idea of who you are change depending on where your focus is in your work? You know, it's a, a, it's a good question. Does my idea of myself change? Um, wow. We could just talk for an hour about, do yeah. you walk around with an idea of yourself or a feeling <laughs> of yourself or, an, you know, um, I wouldn't say my idea of myself actually does change. I really do see myself as a hyphenate. Like I identify as a hyphenate. I've always identified as a hyphenate. Even in, in college, I like made my own major that was like modes of expression, art, dance, and writing. You know, that's amazing. I I created my own, I created my own major at Berkeley college. Yeah. Oh, at Brown. Well, they both begin with B. So there you go. Um, so, you know, I think from the beginning I got a sense of that I, you know, that to be an artist for me meant, and it was funny because my best friend in college was a painter, like, and she was such a painter, like she was a painter, maybe she might veer off to printmaking, you know, that, and, and so I really got a sense of it's different for every artist where you fall in the realm of how hyphenated and how multidisciplinary you are. And I just knew from the beginning I was going to be a multidisciplinary person. Um, You know, at the core, I would say the thing that I can't give up and still feel like myself is a writer. If I'm not writing somehow, I don't feel like I'm me. Everything else comes from that. And 
I really don't understand myself or the world unless it's somehow, I mean, even if it's like, you know, spending a few minutes a day writing a, a real tweet or a post or like if I'm not always in the writing process, I don't connect. I do miss performing when I don't perform also. Um, so, and you know, producing, I just have done as a, to protect my work and that's that. You know, I do produce, but it's to protect my work. And teaching, you know, teaching was sort of an economic thing at first, but then it became so integral to what I do. I There's a certain amount that I like to do of teaching and coaching, but always in, um, always in relation to my own work. I see it as, you know, an offshoot of my own work. I could never be happy just doing that. So I'm very clear about what's at the center. I can live without acting. It's super fun. I love it, <laughs> but I don't have to do it to be myself. That I understand, and that makes a lot of sense. And and your your hyphenate description um, of your of the many things that you do that create who you are. Even you you originally starting off as a visual artist. It it got me thinking when I was preparing for our conversation. And r- I think really the bigger question is: Do you see a difference in in the words "describe yourself" and "define yourself"? Oh, sure. That's interesting because define yourself. I have a, such a negative reaction to <laughs> and describe yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because, you know, if you look at just the words, you know, define and describe, describe has the word scribe in it and it is about writing and it is a written version of yourself. Uh, describe define has the word fine in it and fine is such a problematic word fine you know is there's that one um that one definition of fine effed up insane and i forget what it is but fine is also a contraction of flat line and in 100 percent happy 88 percent of the time as I was thinking about happiness and what it meant to be happy and why do we even want to be happy and what does happiness mean and um I came up with this idea that we look at happiness where you, we see it very linearly unhappy and then you get a little less unhappy and you're finally fine. And then you get from fine to being happy, but linear thinking almost always gets you in trouble. At least me. I mean, I have written on my wall, you know, and lipstick on my window. Creativity is not linear. I mean, we really think it goes one thing and then the other so many times something from way out in left field circles back and is important when you're being creative, you don't know what path it's going to take. It generally is not linear. Um, but you know, and, and this happiness, unhappiness matrix, you know, if you take that line, if you do it like on a string and then you turn it into a circle, the two ends of the string meet on top. If you see life as more circular, which it really is than linear, which it really isn't, um, happiness and unhappiness are really close together and fine is way far away. You just make a little jump over from I'm unhappy to happy like all the time. I mean, what you have to jump over is usually some enormous challenge, a mode of devils, you know, whatever. But it's very close. It's just feels far. We're fine, which is, a you know, really a contraction for flatline and for flatlining and a kind of death. So I think defining feels that way for me. Define yourself feels extremely limited and boxed in. And that's a long answer, but there you go. It's a great answer. You, you know, you're talking about happiness. We're just jumping right into that. And I remember um, I, hearing you talk about, I, it was a quote that I heard you say, that saying you can't just be fine. Fine is a flat line. The equation is change makes us unhappy because we cling, but you have to change to be happy because life is changed. So you have to be yes. unhappy to be happy. And yes. I think that's, I think it's so cool that you, that you embrace unhappiness, that you understand the value of it. I don't know if I embrace it. You know, here's the funny thing. I came up with these <laughs> theories and I had this whole funny Right. story about I was evicted and we bought this house and we moved to the desert and then my whole life fell apart. I don't know. It's a very funny long story for, you know, and then sort of in the middle of touring this show, I was like, I have these theories and I'm not doing it like at all. Like I really had to call myself out on 
all of it. And I think this is the greatest thing, and I'm so grateful for being an artist. So many of the times what we need to learn, it's embedded in our work. I mean, whether you're a painter and it's the way you paint, or you're a writer and it's in your writing. I, I mean, I just, whether, you know, God or whatever speaks to me through, sometimes I know things through writing before I've really fully lived them. And that was the case with this. And I had to really listen to myself. I mean, I only, I'll just give myself one tiny piece of credit, which is that I actually at least finally heard it and then listened and was like, you need to make changes in your life and you need to live by this thing that you understand intellectually. And maybe, you know, you're sort of living. So I really have tried to live it, but it's hard, you know, it's, it's hard to, when you're, you say unhappy. I mean, there's so many words in that bucket, unhappy, right. guilty, uncomfortable, insulted, you know, I mean, the whole list of despair to rage to sadness. And I had to go through a period where I felt, you know, I just was like, okay, I'm going to embrace it. Okay. It might never change. Like maybe I've pushed it down so long that it will never end, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> but still on a bad day it feels like it's never going to end I have that yeah. you know I think yeah. I'm not alone right. in that it feels no, like it's you're... never going to end so change you know that's funny this is a music show that's like the one song I wrote songs and um, did them with Mitch Kaplan who you should have on this show he's amazing your, your uh, music director Mitch yes he, he, yeah and um, that song turned into then the theme song for Uncabaret, which we started, we, we were intending to do a new song at the beginning of every show. And then we mm -hmm. just kept doing, we took that song out of hundred percent happy and just kept doing it. on cab on cab on cab, you know, because people respond to it so much because this is, this is it. I mean, this idea of how to change and how the world is changing and how do we change in a changing world and this giant shift that we're all living through, which was a big part of the hundred percent happy story, you know, the 2012 and, you know, whether or not the world ended, we don't even know. It might've, you know, what, what mm -hmm. world ended and what world are we living in now? And 2012 might mean, you know, 4,000 in galactic time, you know, it's, but anyway, <laughs> it's all, it's all happening. It's all changing. And that's, that's what I like to look at all that. So before we talk about, on Cabaret and really what it's about in this big 25 sure. anniversary show coming up. Take us back to you growing up and what it was like growing up in your family. I know you weren't in oh, a wow. very artistic family, but what led you to, you know, being a little girl to going to Brown and studying art, dance, writing, and okay. performing? Um, I mean, you know, it always felt like it was in me. If I could pinpoint anything, there was nothing in my family, though my parents did have that, you know, whatever makes you happy, which is a lot of pressure, by the way. <laughs> that I have to be happy. All right. Um, and, but also without a clue. Like, they didn't have any suggestions. They were like, figure it out. Um, I was sick. I mean, I think to me, the thing that forged, if you would say, you know, your artistic nature is forged, maybe you're born with it in a molten sense, and then it's forged and it cast somehow into a mold. Um, that for me probably happened in the hospital. I had a autoimmune blood disease when I was five. And it was oh. extremely disconcerting because I was, uh, I felt fine fine. I felt fine. Um, <laughs> and, but I had a bruise and then it was like, Oh mom, look, I have a bruise into, you know, I know, I mean, I didn't make any sense. You're five, but like there was a sense of panic. They thought it might be leukemia. I didn't know what that meant when I was five, but it wasn't. So, you know, I was admitted into the hospital and I was there for a few months and I felt okay. So there's this very disconcerting, reality to be thrown into when most kids are like getting socialized through kindergarten and first grade to be socialized through a system of illness and you feel fine. You really feel okay. Like you could go out and play, but you're sick. You're in the hospital. You're sick. You're around, you're around dying kids. I mean, you're five years old and children are dying around you. And you, mm. I pretty much knew I wasn't going to die, but there was a lot about pain and, um, 
spinal taps and nobody telling me it's going to hurt and then it will be over. Everybody telling me it's not going to hurt and everything hurts. So the, my right. sense of like what hurts and what doesn't hurt. And I think art is in some ways um, an escape. I mean, in a way, art is a drug. Art is where you go to make the world better. Art is imagination. Art is get me the hell out of here. Art is... Um, I'm different and I need to express it. Or it is all those things that, I mean, was I, you know, part of me sometimes thinks, and it's a mystery. I mean, I've come to the part of my life where if people say, how old are you? And like, I've gotten to the part where I'm okay not to have answers. I don't know. I mean, I used to really have to know everything. And now I'm like, I don't know. And that didn't used to be the case. But part of the Isn't mystery is, it is very liberating. It's an enormous yeah. liberation. Um, so part of the, you know, I used to really want it, the answer to, and now I accept the question of, was I different and that, and needed to sort of escape what, you know, was it too closed off of maybe claustrophobic it's a nuclear family, you know, situation. And I'm like, I need an adventure. I'll get sick. I'll go to the hospital. I mean, was that my soul's journey? Was that what happened? Or, you know, did I get sick and then... Um, you know, discover these different dimensions in the hospital. I know that over the course of my life as an artist, I have talked to many creative people who have had childhood illnesses. Um, so I don't know where that, you know, I don't know what kind of answer mm -hmm. it is, but that I have one particular memory of, of I had cold. When I had a cold, I would stay in bed, but, you know, otherwise I was fine. I had to stay in bed, and I had a paint-by-number, and I remember really clearly a nurse saying, don't make a mess. Don't spill it. And I knew as soon as she said this, probably my first introduction to the science of mind. As soon as I had the thought of, oh, no, I guess I'm going to spill it, and then, of course, I spilled it, and I made a mess. And right. then this girl who was much sick, sicker than I helped me clean it up, and I just got service and I got art and I got that art was messy and I knew that I wasn't, I don't know, you know, it's one of those, like, I don't know. Um, anyway, all that. And there was another really, this could actually lead us on cap. There's a really, I've been writing about this. I'm writing an article for the LA weekly about the anniversary. And I was just writing about this. Um, there was one particular memory of the hospital that I think was key to my adult artistic life, which was, I was, sitting in the hallway with the nurse watching other kids play doctor. She just kept thinking, but we're in the hospital. Why do we have to play doctor? I mean, can't we play school or house or, I don't know, astronaut, something, you know. Right, And I mean, I get it. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I, yeah, we could pretend anything. But of course, you know, you want to, like, it's the power and taking the power back and, you know, role playing and all that. But later on in my life when I was unhappy with how the comedy world was, I remember really thinking there has to be a better way. And I flashed immediately to being a kid in the hospital thinking there has to be a different game and never, I mean, why didn't I just go in the room and go like, well, let's play house. You know, was I shy? Were they bigger? Was it scary? I don't mm -hmm. know. You know, all that. But, you know, as an adult, you have the ability to reframe your childhood experiences or to, the, you know, usually the circle just comes around. It's, a, you know, a spiral and you're at a different level of the exact same thing. So I really felt like I'd lived this before and I didn't want to go through another round of I knew it should be different and I didn't do anything to change it. And there you go, the change thing. Sometimes you can change things and sometimes, you know, anyway. That's a long answer, but I think more the hospital than my specific family who were sort of like, right. we don't know. Sure. I mean, they, my mom would take me to the Museum of Modern Art and they were, you know, they were certainly open and, you know, they saw it in me and they didn't try to stop it, but they weren't, you know, themselves that. Right. So when, when you finished college, uh, did, I know you came to LA in 1990, but was was it right out of college or did you stay back East and do some acting and stand up and writing and, or, or, or. Were and I moved to New York. I, New York yeah, first. I moved to New York. Okay. I just dreamt of New York. I, LA to me was, I didn't even know what LA, I didn't, I mean, when I, yeah, I had not, it just seemed like crazy town. <laughs> I, <don't know>. mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to just grow up and be an artist. I just I was right. like, you know, the Museum <laughs> of Modern Art was everything to me. And I, I but I was, it was, 
by the time I moved to New York, I, you know, the loft in Soho was a dream. I was able to move to Williamsburg pretty early on. And I did start doing the visual artist thing. And I had uh, some success as a book artist. My books were shown in the Museum of Modern Art Library and they toured and they were very unusual, one of a kind. Uh, the book art world is extremely, uh, I didn't know this then. I'm just, I just like, I'm like a bull in a china shop. I'm like, I don't know what this thing is. This is what I want to do. You know, I never looked around to see what anyone was doing. I was like, here's my books. Maybe you like them. Um, and, but most of that world is like, you know, very neatly sewn pages and it's very, and I was just like gel, you know, buying stuff on canal street and slopping goop on them. And I was like such a mess. Anyway, <laughs> I got any A's and, and then, oh, and then my first a grant, I, honestly, I started to get this feeling, it was kind of a political thing, because I was living in the ghetto, making art, and then the art world, it just hadn't occurred to me before I moved to New York how much art was about money. I mean, it just never, that's funny, this is a music show. I used to write these little ditties. I'm not a singer. Well, it's I'm not, not a just a music show, but, Beth. Yeah. No, it's, it's, this okay, is a show okay, about, creativity. about creativity and artists, the artist's life. Okay, well, so, you're a musician. Yeah. I'm going to sing you a yes, little ditty. It's not a... It's, okay, so I had this song in one of my shows. was like, on the one hand, you have business. On the other hand, art. Clap your hands, you're praying. It's the schizophrenic part. I need some money to paint my picture of God. That was, you know, the the understanding that art and money, it was this very complicated world, which you don't get as a young idealistic artist. And especially the visual art world is just patrons and... And even the mater- the materiality of art ultimately turned me off. Ultimately, I just didn't want to build a life around things, which the making of physical art requires. And um, I think at a certain point, you know, you start to look around for what you're exceptionally gifted at rather than what you enjoy and all that. Anyway, I started making these books, but there, and I missed performing. I had been a dancer at college and I knew I wasn't going to be a dancer. I mean, I just, you know, what it takes to be a dancer, that wasn't happening, but I loved choreographing and I loved dancing. And, and suddenly I, re, I saw, well, there's performance art. That's a thing I could, oh yeah, I could be doing that. So I made these giant books rather than little books that people would have to buy. Cause I kept thinking now what's going to happen. Okay. They're in shows. Then rich people are going to buy them. I mean, is that the idea? Is that what I'm going for? All right. Um, and that just seemed weird. So I started making, now I'm like, please, where's the rich people? Um, and now I started, then I made these giant, you know, I'm a rich person. Anyway, I made these giant books and I started performing in front of them and schlepping them around. And now I'm really tied to those things. And there was one hilarious summer. I, I tried doing it in, standing in a box that I painted as a house in Washington square park. If you can imagine this. And, um, I learned more about show business probably that summer than in any other circumstance. Anyway, I was there and I, I became a performance artist. A fair, you know, I wrote my first grant was for these big book, this big book kind of performance art. And I just really wrote it without thinking. And I got that grant and I moved into the performance art realm and the work was very multimedia and kind of serious, but then it started to get a little funnier and then I wanted to be funny on purpose. And then maybe it was too funny for the art world And then maybe it was, and then I was really stranded. And then I had a very spiritual moment where I walking to a gig in New York one night, or I don't know where I was walking. And and it just occurred to me, and I don't even know if I still believe this, but at that point it occurred to me that you live life and as soon as you really get it, you die. Like that's just what life was. And either that was insanely tragic or it was, the funniest thing ever. And that like, you got to pick is that is life essentially funny or essentially tragic. And I wanted to choose funny and I don't know, you know, I, I don't know if I even, I believed it then or now, but I wanted to. So I just gravitated towards the comedy world, which was really starting to explode. I mean, I remember standing up in a bookstore reading the Joan Rivers, you know, book and Mae West and the Saturday Night Live tome and, you know, all this stuff. And I started just dipping at, and I didn't, it was a very long crossfade. I didn't go, forget you performance art. Cause I was getting like, it was weird. It was weird because I was getting good gigs as a performance artist. I mean, good performance art gigs, whatever that means. But, you know, 
of like the Institute of Contemporary Arts in Boston, and I would go, and the Boston Globe would give me a big review and giant press and nice hotel, and then I would be doing five minutes at midnight at some comedy club, you know, so it's like ego, no ego, but maybe the rest of my life, you know, it was very, you know, and... And so that's where I went, and, and that's where the transition started. And I all, really only came out uh, to LA because I was newly married, and you know the spouse was I had gotten an agent and was starting to sell screenplays and mm-hmm. my coastal life too hard, and you know, and I was just, I don't know. I guess you, know, you get you know your life presents itself the way it does, and so here right, and yeah. so here I came. Yeah, and that's as good or good as a reason as any. <laughs> of course, to, I mean, if you're, yeah, your, your no, I your love, you know, an opportunity. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The door open, yeah. She walk through together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody, you know, gets shown life. Um, so there it is. And, so, and, and then was, LA was weirder. LA was just harder in terms of comedy. We go ahead. I'm sure you have good questions and you'll lead me through <laughs> yeah. it. Well, it leads me to what was year one like, you know, what, what, what were you doing? Were you doing stand up? Were doors opening? Were you finding that um, nobody really was interested in what you had to say? Or did you have to get a day gig? What was going on with you? No, my day gig was always like this performance art thing. And um, I don't know. I somehow pieced it together. I was broke, but you know, I wasn't yeah. flourishing financially, but right. I was. I just, you know, I just put together the somehow between the performance art and his screen screenwriting and my performance art, and I just the it was funny in the comedy world. Doors were opening, but not that wide. Like I always, there was always enough comedians loved me, but some hated me, but some club. That people were always curious. Like I always was able to get people's attention. I'd been performing hour long shows. I had a lot of. I mean, in New York, had one in like Queens or something. I'd some, you know, these little, you know, one nighter gigs that were you know run outs. And there's this one booker who was like, I don't get it. They're listening to you, but they're not laughing. Like that never happens. I don't get it. And he kept booking me because it was like. He was so mystified. It was just like, what? And then one day he said to me, here's what it is. You're you're doing it like it's jazz, but it's rock and roll. Like you're doing one, two instead of one, two. You're Mm -hmm. emphasizing the wrong thing. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the most helpful thing from the most unexpected source. I'm open to this suggestion. And I walked around New York going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And trying to, like, get that rhythm. And, of course, he was wrong and right because Mm -hmm. any great comedy, the thing you love about it is it's really in their own rhythm. The thing that I hate about the comedy that I hate is it's in that rhythm that just tricks you into laughing. Mm -hmm. just all sounds the same. Like that comedy rhythm. Like you could eat in another room and you're like, oh, yeah, that must be stand-up. Right, the cadence. Yeah. um, In the meter. You know what I mean? That cadence. I do. That's just that robotic stand-up. I never thought about that, yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, that was I, the I, thing that I guess that makes sense, Beth, because you know, music and you know, jazz and comedy were so hand in hand in the fifties and sixties. You know, yeah, you know, Lenny, Lenny Bruce time, and you know, was, there was no yeah. difference. There, you know, there was there'd be a beat poet and a comic and a you know an upright bass player. Yeah, you know, right. There's your, and there's your evening. It's, yeah, yeah. Is and it's more it was about riffing, and there was musicality to it, mm-hmm. and. um Matt Groening, this was the nicest compliment. When we started on Cab, Matt Groening came, used to come watch, and he once said, this is like the blue note in the 50s. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that's so nice. I mean, I will say that my musical, uh, I, I don't even understand jazz, so whatever. But I love rock and roll, so I was so sad to not be rock and roll. But in a way, I got it, <laughs> right. because there's a, there's a conversation that you can hear happening in jazz. And the great comedy is conversational that's what you are drawn into you feel like you're in conversation with a very unique human and when you look at the if you're editing stand-up and i mean i can tell all like all the uncapped people i can if three rooms away just for the rhythm of a voice i can hear oh that's bob odenkirk oh that's taylor negron oh that's julia mm-hmm. sweeney oh that's kathy Gr-. Right. you know i can you just hear the, because their rhythm and the sound of their voice is so uniquely themselves. They're not trying to sound like stand up. 
And that's kind of the goal, isn't it? As a comedian, certainly as a musician, to find your own voice. Yeah, totally. But that isn't what the, so when you were like, were the doors open to you in clubs and stuff to some extent, um, because I was so passionate about it and I was, you know, like we to at the beginning of the, excuse me, conversation, I was like, yeah, writing, you know? So I was always working hard at the writing and the writing and I'm, you know, I'm not even, I'm smart in, in that's not always smart in not always the greatest way. Um, like I was like hundred percent happy at this great idea. I wasn't living it. You know, you can, your brain cannot be your best friend. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, in fact, in New York, <laughs> it was, it was fun. So you, uh, the way it goes in comedy, you know, you try to, you have to get an audition to be able to audition, to be in a room. Like that's a, already a step like, Oh, mm-hmm. okay. You can audition to be in this room. So you do a late night spot or they somehow see you and, I did this audition for the comedy seller and the guy said to me after the show, you know, you're just too grounded in your own cleverness. I got so mad. Wow. Oh my God. I was like, he would never say that to a man. He would never say that to a man. And I just was walked around furious about it for about 10 years. And then, <laughs> and then one night. Because <laughs> you don't hold a grudge ever. Right. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, I didn't think about it for 10 years, but like, you know, maybe sure. once every six months I'd remember it. Like, oh, that yeah. guy. And then, but, you know, anything that gets you that mad, you always have to really think, hmm. And then one day I was like, God, my work, you know. I really am so in my head. There needs to be, I really mean, where's the emotion in that piece? And so I was like, you know, another way of saying that is you're too grounded in your cleverness. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a guy that I, ne- I never, I can't even remember who it is now, but I did that and I remember, I never saw him and he was a New Yorker and I was at a New Year's Eve party in LA, some random thing. And there he was and I got to tell him the story and it was nice. So. Oh, great. Full circle on that. So, Full circle what, on that. So actually what um, inspired you and, and gave you the courage um, or prompted you to create on Cabaret? And, and, and also, can you tell everybody what on Cabaret is about? Sure. Um, on Cabaret is a show that um, there are three things I think that people can, it's a show that's been running 25 years and the idea is embedded in these stories. The idea of what on Cabaret is it's a place for different kinds of comedians and more story based and stories that are essentially in your now rather than, you know, it's not like come and tell me a story. It's not the moth. Uh, we were well before the moth mm-hmm. and it was about, Here's the situation that led to, so I'm going around, I'm in the clubs and I'm frustrated and what's happening in the clubs in the late eighties, early nineties is this thing called the tight 10, which is a perfect 10 minutes that you're getting booked on a late night talk show from. And ultimately you're getting your sitcom from, and you know, hopefully you turn into the next Seinfeld or Roseanne and maybe at the very least you get a holding deal and they pay really well. So this is where comedians are headed. And, um, you know, I'm an experimentalist and I love this jazz form and all of this. And I bristle. It's very defined to go back to our earlier conversation. It's so overly defined and not descriptive. Um, so that's the world. And also, uh, there's, a, I'm, so I'm at the comedy store one night waiting to go on and Andrew Dice Clay is on stage. And if your listeners haven't ever heard of Andrew Dice Clay, he was a extremely, he was a character, sort of a Fonzie type character, but very women. Rough around the edges. Mama, yeah. 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 Very, very misogynist okay, and, right. uh, and abrasive. But a caricature, a caricature, Absolutely. you know, yeah. So he's doing his thing and he's women hating his thing and the audience is laughing and I'm hating him and I'm hating them for laughing at him and I'm hating myself for hating them and I don't do well with hate and it makes me uncomfortable and I, you know, go on and I, you know, I think I'm sure I didn't do well. So I'm, I'm like, there just has to be a better way. And this is what, you know, then you go back to the hospital. Like there has to be a better way. There has to be a different game. And, um, then one, I was still doing the performance art thing too, and I had done the show called Globomania, 
And at the center was this idea that the globe, which is the thing we're trying to save, and we were all becoming, you know, very globe conscious. And there's the image of the Earth from space finally. And I was had some comedy about the Challenger in there, and um, and I was retooling it to go on tour to London. And I was doing it this little, it's very uh, important, but off the beaten track space called the Women's Building, and um, they. I knew what the show was and I knew how funny it was and it was funny, but they thought it was like, I mean, the level of laughter was so high. And after the show, I was like, Oh my God, I wish it was as funny as you thought it was. When was the last time you laughed? And they said, Oh, we don't laugh. We're women and we're artists and we're lesbians. And if we go to comedy clubs, they make fun of us. And I said, I know. Okay. I'm going to come back and make you show. It's going to be unhomophobic, unxenophobic, unmisogynist. It'll be the uncabaret. And it was really that. I mean, it was a direct response to an audience in need that was the final piece because I was frustrated in the clubs. And there were a ton of great comedians who were also frustrated in the clubs. Um, there was like a, you know, an un, untapped creativity thing that was just, you know, ready to explode. And now here's an audience that's telling me they can't even go to comedy clubs, which I know from being in the art world. And the art world is starved for comedy too because everything in the art world has to be so serious so they can't right, laugh in the art right. world either. And, <laughs> you know, and so it's, it was a combination of those three things. So I did a couple shows at the Women's Building and I just started, and I, at first I was like, I don't even know what it is. I just know what it isn't. And I brought fun people in. It was great. They lost their funding. I took it to a space uh, on the west side called Highways Performance Center and where I'd done a bunch of stuff. Stuff. And uh, Taylor Negron and Judy Tall, if anybody knows them, they were, we just did a, a long run of Saturday nights. Then then it was the 92 election. And um, I ran a campaign to make first lady an elected position. I got very involved with that. It was a huge success. And um, I was in People Magazine. And, you know, I was really able to talk. It was, you know, Hillary and Bill and two for one. And, you know, I, I was like, it's a big job. We should pay her. And if we're going to pay her, we should get to pick her. Let's pick her. Let's pay her. And I have, like, really insane art direction for my costumes were, like, wild. And I was on CNN. And I was at the Democratic National Convention. And Oprah wanted me to be on. And I said, no. I was full of the biggest mistake. Anyway, I said, no, people. I said no to Oprah. She wasn't really fully Oprah yet. And um, <laughs> I said yes to Joan Rivers, and then she canceled. And oh, well, show business, whatever. So at the end of the election, um, a club was opening on Robertson, and the guy's name was Jean Pierre Boccaro. And he's, if your listeners may know him, he had also, he was the original owner of Largo on Fairfax, and he had another mm -hmm. club called. Lassa Club, and he opened Luna Park on Robertson, and you know, he was really, you know, from being in the music business, some, some spaces are curated, and, and you go there partly because they're just that space, and you know if you're going to go to that space, it's going to be an interesting right. thing, because there's, it's not, paid, it's not a pay-to-play situation. Right. Yeah. So he, so he called me, and he said, you want to do something? I'm going to open this new space, and it was a great space, because it was um, there was a restaurant, you walked upstairs and then there was a sort of elegant but boho restaurant and then there was a big room upstairs and then you walked downstairs. It's the room that used to be the Rose Tattoo. And you mm -hmm. know, it's interesting, David David Byrne, I don't know if you've ever seen this book about CBGBs, but David Byrne has this great intro where he says the room itself helped shape what the music was. Yes, yeah, that's so well put. And it was long and it was narrow and a certain sound had to come, you know, and that room at, because the on camera at this point was very, it was maybe beta tested and I knew it was a thing and it was enough of a thing that I knew I wanted to keep doing it, but it hadn't a hundred percent solidified. And you walked into, you opened a door, you walked down some stairs, you turned a corner and you faced yourself in this enormous mirror. I mean, enormous mirror, whole giant wall with a beautiful, elegant chandelier under you. You had this ego moment of, you know, outfit <laughs> check and facing yourself. And then you turned away and you walked down another flight of stairs and then through another doorway. And now you're in this womb-like, tiny, little, you know, maybe 120 people packed in, you know, mm -hmm. fire marshal situation. 
and people could sit on the stairs and people could, you know, spill out the other door and it was a stage in the corner and it was just a perfect room. And that was where we landed and he booked us for three nights and we ran for seven years. Um, Mm. And even at that time, I was telling a lot of my friends, and we picked Sundays randomly, but it was very happy accident. Sunday was a day. I mean, Sunday's that day when you expand your soul, whether you go to church, whether you're Jewish, whether you read the big whole New York Times, what, whatever it is. It's, right. You know, and so it's that day. So even when business people came, even if it was like entertainment business people, they weren't actually in their suits. It was like suits out of suits. Mm -hmm. And when we first started, I would invite people and people were still saying to me, stand up, I hate stand up. And I kept going, it's not that kind of stand up, even though I didn't exactly know what it was. And then slowly but surely people were discovering it and they were bringing their friends. And again, the audience is such a key component because the audience brought people and the audience was willing and the audience essentially told us you can't keep doing the same material. Even though I was like, it has to be different than the clubs. I hadn't yet landed on new material all the time until the audience kept coming back. And I was like, people, it's the same people out there. You have got to come up with new shit. So, right. you know, that was, and, and that was essentially the, there was an intimacy to the room. I also knew that when I was on the phone with my friends, they were funnier than when they were on stage. And as a, this was as a producer thought, I mean, as a, I made it for myself to do my own work, but ironically it never was able to be the place I wanted it to be for me because I ended up hosting and producing. So it was never, I, you know, in, in my ideal alter other e world of imagination, there's another on cabaret where someone else made it and hosted it. Right. And you get to <laughs> show up and perform in a free and environment. I just could go right. do it. <laughs> You know, I re- Beth, I read uh, an interesting description of Uncabaret that said it's a marriage of audience and performers who needed to work together. And I think, oh. you know, and I, I love that. I, who said that? Yeah, I, think I love I, it. Um, you might have said it. I'm I'm not sure where oh. I found it, but just in, just in well, preparing for our conversation. <laughs> yeah, I think That's you hilarious. said it, actually. Yeah. And but that kind of makes sense now, the way you're describing it, because with the same audience coming back, it, it, this community, this collective, interactive, um, organic experience that you all kind of, in a sense, created together. You know, you sort of steered the yeah. ship, it, se- it seems like, but but you were paying attention to what needed to exist. Yeah, that's exactly it. And then, um, you know, and then there was a lot of what happened. You know, sometimes it just happens organically and you just try not to get in the way. I was so young. I mean, I wish I knew what I know now at that time because there was so much energy. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, it, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, it was a lot of, and then what happened at a certain point, we, at the, that initial phase of like building the talent pool and the people were the, you know, the performers who were really loving it were then bringing their friends. So there was a group from the Ben Stiller show and there was a group mm-hmm. from the Groundlings and there was, you know, people, there were like little clusters of, you know, finding people. And, um, and it was just a magical, magical time. And then it started to explode. There were some, you know, then people were like, Oh, I think I'll do a show like that. You know, copycat kind of show. Well, I don't want to say, co- you know, I mean, it's not a movement begins. So, you know, right. there's energy around it. So, you know, it explodes. And, and then there was a, when people still read the LA times, if you can get into your time machine and remember <laughs> that time, um, there was an above the fold story in the calendar section on a Friday that we were, that was us. And that's such a moment that, you know, doesn't exist anymore because right. there's no centralized, but then Source it was like, of information. like to get right. in. Then it was sort of awful. Cause then it was like, Oh my God, it's the hot thing. And then it's like, under you're under a microscope. And mm-hmm. anyway, then a lot of show business stuff happened. But you've, you've always, <laughs> uh, you've always drawn, amazing talent to the show you know there i mean was that fairly i mean that that was just your people that was your tribe right you know when when you yeah i mean it was a tribe yeah sandra bernhardt and kathy griffin tig nataro julia sweeney yeah i'm naming all women there are a lot of great men as well yeah yeah there 
yeah, sure, the men, whatever. No, yeah, whatever. Were, right. <laughs> so, I mean, what about great men? Um, by, the, by the way, let me. In this, I, I, I'm just oh, curious because we're talking men and women right now. Was when when you were at the comedy store? Did you ever feel that that Mitzi was um, like more pro woman or kind of watched out for her 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 girls or what or or was she just trying I, to fill the seats or or I didn't really just ever get that feeling. Or, okay, I wasn't that deep in. I mean, you know, I just I was I was never central at the comedy store. <laughs> um, I, can't, I don't have any really brilliant insights to Mitzi. I don't think other people can speak better to that. I never felt like she was, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I it seemed like a dangerous place to me. I never, I had things thrown on at me from stage. Right. My work was sure. not, my own work wasn't flourishing there. I felt right. I was getting less funny the longer I worked there. I knew I had to get mm-hmm. out. And But I yeah. also wasn't like, you know, since then I've gone back and done fun sets and, you know, mm-hmm. everybody's on their path. It wasn't a good place for me at that time, but right. I don't know about Mitzi. Yeah. And, and Bud and Mark at the, at the improv was, did you feel welcome there or was it just, uh, just another stage and another, yeah. You know, um, where did, where did you feel at home? I, I guess nowhere. That's, that's why I created okay. on Cabaret. I didn't feel Got at it. home in any of these, places. but I have to say there was a women's night at the Laugh Factory, which is kind of a ghetto, a women's night. But mm-hmm. I do tell young comedians, if you can get in in a ghetto, get in in a ghetto, you know, yeah, whatever start, it is, you know, somewhere. if it's your start somewhere. I mean, if you're getting good stage time, you need the stage time. So whatever it takes. So there was a women's night at the Laugh Factory that I remember I did a lot and I got a lot of stage time there. Um, the improv this is a funny little side story. I did a night at a performance art gig and there was a manager there who was dating one of the dancers and he was managing Paul Reiser and he was managing uh, Tori Amos. And he said, you're really funny. I can get you an audition at the improv. And I was like, Oh my God, that'd be amazing. So he did, which is amazing. And I went and I, I went in and I was really nervous. Um, I still didn't feel comfortable in the comedy clubs. I didn't feel like, oh, God, I'm finally at my place. I was like, oh, I hope they like me kind of feeling. And I had a joke at the time that I opened with. I didn't always open with it, but I opened It was an abortion joke, and it went like this. Uh, I had to have an abortion. I don't feel that well. I had to have an abortion today. I didn't actually have to have one. I wasn't pregnant or anything. But... <laughs> You know, I had the time, I had the money, and I figured I better get one while they still let us. <laughs> right. And only recently has that joke become important again. Um, and I opened with it, and I got the lot. You know, before I went on stage, yeah. I said to the guy, so seven minutes, and he said, well, however long it takes. And that, to me, was like, I know you're going to fail, and, you know, and that was, you know, that's that's my issue. That's not his issue, you're a comedian, you're a performer. It doesn't matter what somebody says to you. That's God putting, you know, in front of you. But I wasn't at that place then. You know, now it's like, well, all right, you can say whatever you want. I'm in my space and whatever. Sure, sure however long it takes. If I have one minute on stage, I, it's a blessing and I'll make the most of it. And it'll be right. a joyful, you know wonderful you, experience. You know who you are yeah. and, and what it is in your purpose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and you know if you have thirty seconds, you do it in thirty seconds. It doesn't right. matter. It's all holographic. I mean, but I didn't. That's you know, I didn't have that then. So you know, you are where you are when you're there. Anyway, I just you know, I was uncomfortable, and anyway, I did that joke, and I got the light, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> but not that's not true. But like, but the comedians were in the back of the room laughing. But I don't even uh-huh. know. Maybe I could have even had a callback, but I just ran out, and then yeah. I never called that guy back. And thanked him for having the audition because I was young and I was just filled with shame and whatever. Then, like, eight years ago or seven years ago or whatever, Mitch and I were having lunch at our favorite little lunch Chinese place. And we walked out. And this guy who I don't know, who I didn't know him, Mitch vaguely knew him. It was such a god shot. This guy said, oh, Beth Lapidus. And I said, yeah. And he said, you know who you should call? You should call Arthur Spivak. 
so weird. I mean, it was like one of these, like, I was like, and at that point in my life, I'm like, okay, if God wants me to call, I'll call. I mean, it was like, <laughs> why was somebody going to say that? And Arthur was the guy who got me that improv audition. I was like, I guess I'll call him. And he was so happy to hear from me. Oh, I was great. like, this is a call. It's like 20 years late. Anyway, he became my manager. And, um, all those many years later. So, I, you know, I would every now and then do a spot at the improv or the comedy store. Uh, we just did it on Cabaret. We did a pop-up at the Laugh Factory. Um, I've done, you know, it's since then. I've had great times at all those clubs. But as a home, uh, I never felt like, I always felt like I was visiting some friends. You know, and now I feel like when I go there, I'm visiting friends, and that's awesome. Right. And, you know, and I can, I, lo I love working there. But, you know, what I was trying to do with Uncap was a different, it was a fully different experience because, it wasn't in a comedy club, taking comedy out of a comedy club. You know, there was just a different vibe to having it be in a music environment or a theater. Right. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. We are, um, <laughs> it's no surprise. We have got about seven minutes left in our hour of what? conversation. I know. It's, and so I want to do, let's do a quick shameless plug on the 25th anniversary show on November 11th. I want you to tell everybody where it is. And I do have a few more questions to ask you. And we're also going to put a link to the show on the website. So I want to encourage everybody Great. to go out and support uh, this really funny and smart collective of artists that, that get out there and and 25 year anniversary of anything needs to be supported. You know, it's just, so, oh. so, so we're <laughs> telling everybody you know, where funny. it's at. I've seen a lot of 25 year anniversary things coming up this past year. I think a lot happened all at once 25 years ago. Yeah. I, um, I released the we, 25 year best of record uh, as well. So oh, I, okay. I can relate. That's Absolutely. amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be at theater at the ACE, which is, one of the historic, beautiful Los Angeles. I mean, even if our show wasn't a show you wanted to see, which it is, you want to be in this theater. It's 1,600 seats, but it's yet so intimate and it's beautiful. And it was the original United Artists. It was the Mary Peckford United Artists Theater. So we're really in alignment with this theater, even conceptually, because the United Artists on Cabaret, the U and artists all coming together. So there's that. Uh, we're also under the auspices of CAP UCLA. They're the amazing people that produce the seasons at Royce Hall. And they're doing a season this year also at Theater at the Ace and um, in their season this year is Friendly Boots also at the Ace, David Starris is at Royce Hall, they've got a jazz series that's amazing um, all sorts of interesting, they're, they're, it's a great organization to keep your eye on, they produce incredibly interesting stuff. So it's CAP UCLA at Theater at the Ace and it's November 18th which is 11 18, 18 a very magical number and uh, tickets are actually really going and the floor in the, I think there's only six seats left in the mezzanine. The floor is gone, so um, there's only balcony seats left, and, you know, that's a nice place to watch the show from. It'll be great. It's a super intimate theater, and you won't be too far away, but don't wait until November 18th to try to get your tickets. Perfect. Uh, the lineup. You might want to know the lineup. Who are some of the people? Besides the special guests, that can't be announced. Um who will be on? Bob Odenkirk is on. If you watch Better Call Saul uh, or uh, Breaking Bad, of course, Bob Odenkirk, enormous star. He's been with us almost the whole way. Janine Garofalo is not often seen in Los Angeles. Maria Bamford, very cutting edge on uh, issues of mental health, one of a very brilliant performer. In the music area, we'll have Allie Willis is going to be with Wonderful. us. She wrote, uh, September. uh, you know, you know, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, my, and, and also of, the friends theme song yeah, <laughs> and the color purple. <laughs> so, uh, on and on anyway, uh, check. So check the website. everybody There's go check out. People. Yeah. Check out the website and definitely go. Uh, we've got four minutes left. So, uh, I have closing questions. I always ask my guests, but before that, I just have to ask you, you had four dinners with Joni Mitchell. What's the, yes. short, the short story on that? Um, lucky, lucky, answer. lucky. Yeah. <laughs> the 30 second answer. Wow. Um, it was a friend. She was the best friends of a friend who had, you know, just, I don't know how people circle through, but anyway, it was like a last minute invitation. And, um, 
to join them and it was I canceled other things and I the whole time was just like just don't say anything just don't say anything just sit there and listen don't say a thing that's about 12 people and I happened to be seated right across from her Mm -hmm. and she just like told stories and looked into my eyes and at one point in one of the stories she's a brilliant storyteller by the way I mean had she not had a musical career her storytelling is I tried to get her to let me help her write a book because her stories are so off the charts. She was like holding my hand in one of the stories. Mm. I did end up at her house on a New Year's Eve singing uh, Old Lang Syne with her, and then I made her laugh. So I went, uh, I made Joni Mitchell laugh. So my, my comedy like career that. is complete. Yeah. <laughs> and she was actually in the car and smoking, and so... We let, I saw, of course, I gave her the front seat, and she's sitting in the passenger seat, and she's smoking, and an ash fell, and I sat in, it was Mitch's car, and I sat with my feet, we just left that ash in the car for, like, <laughs> as long as it stayed together. <laughs> I was, like, months, it's like, look, it's the Jody Mitchell ash. Oh, oh that's so funny. Oh, my God, uh, so, I adore her, so. So, two minutes left in our show, and w- Here's the questions. There's three questions. And the the first is a two part. What does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? And can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? I wish you had given me that to prepare. Um, Making it means being able to do the work that you're passionate about and have an audience there to see it and be making enough money that you don't have to, uh, that you're not fretting about money. That really is making it. Everything else is gravy that's that's the that's the dream uh and work i would it, and working with people you respect and and push you creatively um three tips for it. success that's oh that's great that's great uh three tips for success that have driven your career stubbornness yeah willingness and um, working with great people. Excellent. Those are three things. Being stubborn, you know, I guess to elaborate, knowing the difference between being stubborn and being, persi- you know, what's that persistent fine line? Persistent and tenacious. You, you should, yeah, yeah. Yeah, persistent and tenacious. And, and but also being open, you know, being open to knowing you don't know everything. That's the willingness part. And surrounding yourself with just, Playing tennis with people who are better than you. It's just that principle. And in our last 30 seconds, at this point of your life, Beth, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? (laughs) Oh, my God. Everything I've just said, but specifically, um, yeah, I think this thing from the happiness thing, you know, to have the courage to be unhappy and feel those feelings. And, um, I tell myself the same thing. I try to tell myself every day, even now, my older self, you know, uh, give yourself half a break and then be harder on yourself. Give yourself more credit and then, then be tougher. Beth, thank you for spending the hour with me. Beth Lapidus. It's great to talk with you. Thank you so much, Terry. What a pleasure. Congratulations on an amazing career. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for joining us this week. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wolf. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Room. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. 
This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. 